Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors episode 80 and the final instalment of our All Things Berlin series. I'm your host Natalie Gruniger and I'm so glad that you could join us. As always, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron and thank everyone who's taken time to rate and review the show. Your support and encouragement is very much appreciated. If you love the podcast and never miss an episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. It's easy to do. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. June's prize is a choice of two fabulous Tudor-themed mugs from the Colouring Tudor History Collection. Visit ColouringTudorHistory.com to view the range, and a big thank you to Catherine Holman for sponsoring this wonderful prize. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about Berlin treasures is James Peacock. James's fascination with the Tudors, and in particular Anne Boleyn, started in childhood when he visited historic sites including Hever Castle and the Tower of London. At a young age, he was introduced to Anne of the Thousand Days and BBC drama Elizabeth R. And from there, his love grew. After moving to Sydney, Australia in his teens, he began his career in youth and community work. James continued this career after moving back to the UK, but his interest in the Tudors came back to the forefront again in his early 20s. And from then on, James has been researching in a more in-depth basis, and in 2014, He created the Anne Boleyn Society, a social media platform providing historically accurate information about Queen Anne, her daughter Queen Elizabeth, and other aspects of the Tudor court. With accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, the Anne Boleyn Society serves more than 20,000 members. For the last seven years, James has been working as a state apartment warder at Hampton Court Palace. His duties there include caring for the precious artefacts and paintings, bringing the rich stories of the palace to life, and occasionally opening and closing the visitor routes. My conversation with James straight after this musical break, courtesy of singer-songwriter Carleen. The song My Mother's Daughter is from Carleen's best-selling album, inspired by the life of Elizabeth I. I was only three The day he took you away from me I remember that day in May Mother, mother Do you see Does it make you proud? I didn't let you define me, but I kept you alive inside me.
Welcome back to Talking Tudors, James. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me back again, Natalie. Thank you. Oh, it's so wonderful. Thank you. Now, it's actually been a year since we last chatted about Anne Boleyn on the podcast. And for any of our lovely listeners, that was actually episode 32, if you'd like to have a listen to that episode as well. But since then, we've had lots of wonderful new people find the show. So would you mind, James, just introducing yourself to our listeners and telling us a little bit about your background? Yes, of course. Yeah. First of all, I just want to say um, I hope everyone's doing well at the moment and all we'll family and loved ones and everything um obviously at the time of recording this we're just still in lockdown at the moment so who knows if we've if we've come out of it by now yeah our fingers crossed but yes um hopefully it's now just very on its way to becoming a distant memory for everyone the Amberlynn society basically i set it up in 2014 so about six years ago now gosh time does fly it does. Um, <laughs> and I set it up because obviously Anne Boleyn is a very popular figure in history. There's been so much written about her, but there's also a lot of myths still out there about her. And I just thought, let's, because, you know, there's other societies set up, like Richard III Society. And I thought, well, Anne Boleyn really should have a society set up for her as well. She was quite an incredible woman who contributed a lot to history. So I thought, well, why don't, we, why don't I try and set one up and see how it goes, see how, you know, let's see if people are interested. And I, and I generally thought to myself at the time, oh, you know, maybe one day down the line I'll have a couple hundred people or something <laughs> on there. And, of course, it took off far bigger than I could ever have hoped it to. Um, so and that's all thanks to obviously your support Natalie because you were there right before the beginning and everything as well and um, so yes and obviously it's grown on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I've obviously been very fortunate to be involved in uh, lots of projects and stuff since then and obviously with uh, all things Berlin as well with this uh, <laughs> and on talking Tudors and um, obviously Natalie you were right there from this before the very beginning even. I think you were one of the first people I ever contacted. So, uh, yeah, so it's been an incredible journey. And um, so that's kind of why I set it up, really. And I've been very fortunate to have so many people join since then. 
Well, James, I, I love supporting your work because it's just a wonderful site and and I think lots of listeners that are that are listening will will probably be familiar with your work on Facebook and Instagram. You've you've got a huge following on Instagram and you I, I know how long it takes to create that sort of content that you come up with. So thank you very much for everything that you do as well. It's oh, it, yeah, it's really wonderful. Now, James, the topic for today's All Things Berlin conversation is Berlin treasures. So let's dive right in. What are some of your favourite Berlin artefacts? Okay, so first of all, I'll make an apology because this question, my answer may go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> so there are so many incredible artefacts connected to Anne Berlin still, and I think people don't often realise just quite how many there are. And uh, some of my favourites are actually at Hever Castle, um, oh, yes. which is a, a beautiful location itself. I encourage everyone who ever gets a chance to go there. If you're coming over to England, I consider it one of the most important places you must visit. It's not too hard to get to from London as well, actually, despite, you know, it seeming to be quite out in the country. But it's home to two Book of Hours that were owned by Anne Boleyn. And they connect us so much to her story. And so there's so much that we can tell from her personality um, just from those books themselves. And I think that's something that people often, you know, that's a huge, just incredible connection there. You know, they also bear her inscriptions as well in them. And they you know they just connect her more to the you know to the religion and reformation which again is something people don't often connect with Anne you know we don't often see her for some reason in, in history she's obviously not portrayed as someone who is a um, you know religious person but actually in actual fact she was and these these two books were owned by her she would have held them she wrote in them and it's just it's just incredible really so those are two of my favourites, but also at Hever there are two portraits of Anne that are my personal favourite. Obviously the Hever Castle Rose portrait, which I use as the Anne Boleyn Society profile picture, and the portrait in her bedroom, of well, it's at Hever, it's called her Anne Boleyn's bedroom, that are just two beautiful portraits of her there. So I would, I would say those are probably my top, two or I suppose three or four if you could say because two book of hours two portraits um, <laughs> and obviously there are other favorites as well but I'll, I'll leave them till later in the in the talk because <laughs> otherwise we'll never get on to those questions <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny that you should mention obviously we like we both love you know the Hever Castle artifacts but I was talking to Owen Emerson which works there recently and he said something that really struck me he, he mentioned when he was talking about the fantastic book of hours that they have that they have Anne's DNA and I was kind of like oh my god that is such an incredible connection like like you said she would have held these prayed with these who knows maybe cried with them like there's such a personal uh, there's a really personal connection with them so I'm I'm with you James I absolutely love them as well oh thank you yeah no that is that is incredible when you think about it actually I didn't I that's as I was saying that, I didn't actually consider that. But like you said, that is true. They would have had her DNA. They do have her DNA on them, uh, which obviously so many things, obviously the portraits don't. Um, so that is just incredible, really. It is. It's but, mind-blowing, but, isn't it? Uh, and what about Thomas and Elizabeth Berlin? Are there any kind of surviving items associated with those those people? The first two that come to mind, well, probably really one for each of them, is the brass memorial that um, decorates Thomas's tomb at uh, yes, yeah. Church. and that's really probably one of the the, the only surviving artefacts connected to him really other than obviously any letters or something from his times as ambassador or diplomat and stuff which he was a very um, well respected one of course and obviously with Elizabeth Boleyn as you know Natalie there's the um, in the garden museum the um, stone uh, ledger yes, yes. that would have been on her her tomb and the sad thing is of Elizabeth Boleyn she's almost an enigma really more so than her daughter Mary there's really nothing that survives connecting her this woman who Anne obviously had with her quite a bit when she was um, you know obviously uh, in her early days of relationship with Henry she would have accompanied her at coronation and stuff but there's so little that survives of her just in spite of like mentions of 
Anne's concern for her health while she's in the tower, and which is so sad. So those that sort of thing is such a real treasure, a connection to Elizabeth. And I'm so pleased it's on display, obviously, at the Garden Museum, which, um, for those listeners who obviously haven't didn't know this before, is where she's buried. Obviously, there's a huge story about why that's now the Garden yes. Museum. People might think that's weird, but... As you know, it's, it kind of has saved the church from possibly being pulled down or something. So it's incredible just to have that, but also to have that would, would have been on her tomb. And the fact that you can just about make out Countess of Wiltshire as well, is it's just incredible, really. And it's like the last surviving or only surviving artefact of her. So it's so unbelievably precious. That's so true. And I always think with that particular stone ledger, I wonder who went to obviously pay their respects to Elizabeth. You know, at some point, I always wonder, did Elizabeth ever go? We don't have a record of that. This is just me kind of wondering and using my imagination. But, you know, did she stand over that particular ledger thinking about her grandmother? So it's really interesting when you start thinking about those links. And I do also recommend if our listeners haven't seen an image of Thomas Boleyn's brass, the one that you mentioned in the church just near Hever Castle, to please have a look. I, I'll put some some pictures up as well when this episode goes live because it is quite an amazing piece in itself. He's dressed in the full regalia of the um, Knights of the Garter. Uh, so it's, it's quite an extraordinary and quite a moving, I think, monument as yeah. well. And just nearby, as I know you know, James, because you've been there, is, of course, the little plaque to little Henry Boleyn uh, that obviously died sometime in during infancy. He's buried quite close to his father, which I think is quite touching as well. Absolutely. I mean, the church is just, it's a stunning little church, as you know, and and um, it is, whenever yeah. I visited Hever, I, I call into that church first to pay my respects to Thomas. And, um, and there's only been one time, actually, which was one time when I went during half term about a year and a half ago, um, October half term, that um, it was actually busy in there. When I say busy, I have more than five people in there, <laughs> yes. which, uh, which, I, which uh, I considered as busy because every other time I visited, I've pretty much been the only person in there. So, um, and, it, and I think, like you said, people go to Heaven, and they don't necessarily go to that church, which is a shame because it has such a huge connection. The Berlins would have frequent in that church all the time and it's just incredible really. It is it's very atmospheric. Now James I wanted to ask you about another artifact that people may have heard of in a church called St John the Baptist Church and I hope I'm saying I apologize if I'm not pronouncing this correctly but in Sirencester I hope that's right (laughs) (laughs) and it's a silver cup and cover but what's really interesting is that it's adorned with Anne's falcon badge. What can you tell us about this particular item? Yeah, well, first of all, I would say don't worry about the pronunciation of words because <laughs> my pronunciation of most words is completely wrong. <laughs> most of the time, I'm always getting it muddled up. So uh, uh, the Berlin Cup, is it's got a rather sweet little story to it, actually, because um, there's a possible connection to Anne's daughter Elizabeth with it as well. Uh, so, yes, it's made in... 1535, obviously, the last year that Anne is queen, and it's made of silver and gilt. And at the top is Anne's badge of the falcon on Treason, which obviously, listeners may know, was Anne's um, symbol as she was queen. According to the church, or really there's two sort of theories about this. One, there's one that when Elizabeth became queen, or even before she became queen, the cup was passed to her and in her possession, and then she gave it to Richard Master, who I should also say was Anne's physician, and um, he gifted it to the church where it's been ever since. But there's also another theory, is that Anne actually gave it to Richard Master herself after he had cared for her daughter Elizabeth. So either way, it's got a huge connection to Elizabeth as well, which is actually quite sweet, because I'm particularly interested in how... Elizabeth would have remembered her mother and yes we don't have many documented reports of her speaking about her mother but there are a lot of little clues here and there um, which I could go into for hours and hours on end um, (laughs) about how she would have how she remembered her mother and certain features and I know there's a later question coming up on this so I'll hopefully not um, go too much off off track before then but yeah that's (laughs) A, a beautiful sort of connection there and it's it's just it's a beautiful cup itself really and it's just incredible and um one of the last 
few surviving artifacts that Anne could have actually have owned, would have actually have owned that still survives today. Yeah, that's amazing. I haven't seen that one in person yet, so I'm I'm hoping next time I get to England that'll be on my yeah. one of the stops on my travels. And now there's another item also a silver gilt item. And some if you're listening and you visited Heber Castle, you may have seen a clock there. And it's known kind of as Anne Boleyn's clock. That's actually a replica of an item in the Royal Collection, a silver gilt clock known as Anne Boleyn's clock. So what, what do we know about the provenance of this particular item? The one at Heber obviously is a beautiful little clock and stuff. And like you say, it's a um, a replica. And the it's described as a gilt bronze wall hung clock um, with striking movement with a single steel hand and it's in a, a square tabernacle case I hope I pronounced that right <laughs> I'm doing it right, um, and it's also uh, got this um, surmounted by a leopard holding a shield with the royal coat of arms and garter now the leopard was also a symbol that Anne herself used um, during the time that she was queen there's a report that the um, clock was given by Henry to Anne on the morning of their marriage according to the royal collection at least which um in case anyone doesn't know the royal collection is actually uh, well the royal collection trust is artifacts and painting scenes that are owned by the queen and held in trust for the nation so according to them they say that it was given by henry to anne on the morning of their wedding in 1532 so there's obviously um, as you know, Natalie, two conflicting dates given for their marriage. So it's most likely that Anne and Henry would have had a marriage, I believe, so in 1532, particularly when you look at, for example, when Elizabeth was born in September 1533. Um, so that's the story behind it for the royal collection. It was later said to have been given to Horace Walpole by Lady Germain, and it was then brought by Queen Victoria, who obviously, as you know, in her reign, um, the chapel of the Tower of London was renovated, yes, and yeah. of the Anne's burial place finally received a, a marking on it. And um, Queen Victoria actually bought it at the sale of Horace Walpole's collection of Strawberry Hill in 1842 and so yes in the royal collection today and obviously the replica is at Heber Castle it just looks absolutely stunning um, in the pictures of it and obviously I really hope to see it in person one day there's so much detail on that on that very clock there and it's an, an incredible well one of the gifts as we know that Henry must have given to Anne at some point um, in their in their relationship. Yeah, it is a beautiful item. And a lot of the items in the Royal Collection you can have a look at online. I think sometimes they don't all have images, which is a bit frustrating, but I'm pretty sure there are images of that one online for people to have a look at. Now, the other thing that I know both you and I love, James, are letters, of (laughs) course, written by the Tudors. That is amazing to think of them there at their desk, you know, scratching away. So there's a particular letter that I really love, and I think you do too. And it's a a letter that Anne wrote to Wolsey, but what makes it fantastic, and this was in 1528, what makes it just an amazing artefact is that there's a postscript from Henry. So can you tell us about this particular letter? Yeah, of course. It's it's an incredible letter. That, as I said, I saw it um, in the British Library about, oh gosh, four years ago now when I visited with Sandra Vassily and we were doing some very important research there together, who I know has been featured on um, Talking Tudors. And this letter was actually on display at the time. I'm not entirely sure if it still is, um, because as I say, four years and I haven't visited since, which I know is terrible. (laughs) Um, But um, there's this incredible letter there that to me, and I know to Sandy and to you as well, Natalie, just speaks volumes about Anne and Henry's relationship. And there's not much that survives informal letters from Anne herself. And as we know, with the the letters that Henry wrote to Anne, which, again, I'll give a special shout out here to Sandra Fasoli, who discusses that in her podcast, but we don't obviously have Anne's replies. So this Something like this is just so incredible to think she would have written, she wrote this and this is her letter. And obviously it has a postscript added from Henry. And the letter is to to Cardinal Wolsey and Anne is thanking him for his efforts in trying to obtain Henry VIII the divorce from, as we know, from Catherine of Aragon. She starts off with, my Lord, in my most humblest wise, that my heart can think, I desire you to pardon me, that I am so bold to trouble you with 
my simple and rude writing, esteeming it to proceed from her that is much desirous to know that your grace does well. And, um, you know, she goes on to say, as I perceive by the bearer that you do, the which I pray God long to continue, as I am most bound to pray. For I do know that the do know the great pains and troubles that you have taken for me is never like to be recompense on my part, but alone in loving you next unto the king's grace above all creatures living. And I do not doubt, but the daily proofs of my deeds shall manifestly declare and affirm my writing to be true, and I do trust you to think the same. My lord, I do assure you, I do long to hear from you news of the legate, for I do hope, as they come from you, they shall be very good. And I am sure you desire it as much as I, and more, and it were possible, as I know it is not, and thus remaining in a steadfast hope, I make an end of my letter, written with the hand of her that is most bound to be your humble servant, Anne Boleyn. But then underneath that is an ad- is a postscript added by Henry, and how he starts this, and what he writes there is just incredible. And he says, the writer of this letter would not cease till she had caused me likewise to set my hand, <laughs> desiring you, though it be short, to take it in sh- take it in good part i ensure you that there is neither of us but greatly desireth to see you and are joyous to hear that you have escaped this plague so well trusting the fury of thereof to be past especially with them that keepeth good diet as i trust you do and he obviously goes on to um wish him good health and everything but i just that to me just speaks volumes of their relationship right there and i just love the way he's uh, the way he says that you know you could just imagine Anne, yeah. pressure, you know <laughs> saying to henry that she he had to add a postscript as well he had to add something to the letter and she would not cease until he did that something about that simple small sentence there just something just to me just speaks as i keep saying i know i keep waffling on speaks volumes of their relationship right there like they worked together as a team particularly in those early days and i know that people are going to have different views and everything on Anne and henry's relationship oh she was an obsession to him blah, 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 and everything like did they really love each other didn't they i think seeing that just to me speaks out that they work together as a team and that letter that little letter that survives that you know often gets you know mentioned in the books biographies but doesn't get given too much thought there's something about so it's it's incredible really that how something so small a sentence can just speak out so much across the centuries to us today i absolutely agree with you james i think especially when we consider that henry disliked writing he was very reluctant to handwrite which is why his love letters to Anne Boleyn are so incredible and also why this letter is particularly fantastic because it, as you said, speaks of not only Anne's character, which is yes. <laughs> comes through very clear, but also of, of how comfortable they were together. Their relationship at this point, you can tell they were comfortable. She yeah. was able to badger the king in order to Absolutely. get him to write. I think, I, think it's, I think it's lovely. I think it's such a lovely vignette and a very yeah. revealing one yeah. too. Yeah, when you take into account reports, even after they were married, about how, yes, they would have these passionate arguments, but then they would passionately make up afterwards. And they would often be together, and particularly in, around this time as well, like she would be with him when... Wolsey would visit him and stuff so they really did work as a team quite a lot and I think looking back on hindsight obviously people you know understandably always look at how it all ended why it all ended and that's a whole other mystery in itself but we mustn't forget particularly on those early days and to be honest right up to near the end as well just how closely they worked together at times as well and how strong their relationship was. Absolutely. And it shows Anne's perseverance, doesn't it? <laughs> Indeed well. it does. Indeed it does. And Absolutely. just just yeah. as a note for our for our listeners, if you're wondering about the the very overly flattering language, this was the style of Tudor letters. They were extremely they were, you know, if you were trying to obviously get something from somebody, they were overly flattering. So we can't really read too much into Anne's relationship with Wolsey because this yeah. is how they spoke to one another in letters. So so it's really Absolutely. interesting though, isn't it? 
Absolutely. And I do apologise for going off on the tangent with the no. letter there. If there's any chance to mention their own words, I oh. very quickly jump on that bandwagon. <laughs> and honestly, it is one of my absolute favourite items. And and I have shared a picture of it before, and I'm going to do that again just so that everyone gets to see it because yeah. it's interesting to compare Anne's lovely handwriting to Henry's kind of boisterous, you know, larger than life handwriting. It's really yeah. interesting. Now, sure. James, the British Library, you've just mentioned that letter, but it's actually home to quite a number of, of treasures, including oh. Anne's illuminated book of hours and also a book that was translated by George Berlin in which he's inscribed it as well. But there's another fascinating item that you've come across and it's a genealogy of Elizabeth I. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, well, basically when um, Sandra Vasley and I visited the British Library in 2016, she was obviously doing her own research and I um I wanted to research more because I'm fascinated by genealogy and how people are related to who and and you know I regularly love to talk about how the royal family today descends from like either Mary Boleyn or as well as the Seymour family, Charles Brandon's sister um, and his wife Mary Tudor. I really wanted to look up anything to find with genealogy and Sandy obviously felt doing her own little digging before then to sort of give me a helping hand came across this um, a mention of this book, The Genealogy of Elizabeth I. It, they do, on the British Library website, they do have a couple of images of this, but it doesn't do it justice. And my description isn't going to probably do it justice either, because it is just incredible. The illuminations on the pages were just exquisitely designed. Basically, it's traces Elizabeth I's descent from Robert, or as he's known in the book as Rollo for some reason, first Duke of Normandy. So we go from her right up to, from him, sorry, right up to Elizabeth I. And so as you can imagine, it's a pretty big book. In yes. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of clicking through pages and everything. To, and it was so beautifully done because it sort of starts on the, each page sort of starts on the left hand side and it's done and it branches off like a tree going off and there's little images here and there of the next person and the descendants and it goes on right up as you can imagine to you know William the Conqueror and stuff and you know the other kings and queens and everything in there and and then it reaches obviously Henry and Elizabeth However, before that, I'll say that Sandy and I were eagerly looking through this book, getting we were getting quite excited when it's coming to coming to the pinnacle, as it were, of the of the genealogy book. And we were thinking, oh, what's it? You know, the portraits of Henry and Anne and everything. And, you know, oh, how nice to see that. We got to the page and I have to say there was a slight disappointment because it doesn't have a portrait of Henry and Anne. Oh, I know. However, there is something else that re- to, to both of us that really struck out, and it's how Anne in particular is described. And I will read out actually where how she um, is described on this. And once again, I do say I do apologise, everyone, um, but I'm about to delve into another description here, written <laughs> in the Tudor style, as it were. <laughs> So obviously, first of all, um, I'll just mention Henry is described obviously as the most excellent and victorious Prince Henry VIII was crowned King of England and France and Lord of Ireland in the year of our Lord 1509. But it's Anne Boleyn's description that to me really kind of was like, wow. Because often, as you know, Natalie, even today, people can be quite dismissive of Anne. They treat her as the mistress or they don't believe she was the actual queen of England. They feel she displaced Catherine of Aragon. And even obviously back then, Anne came under a lot of attack. There were a lot of things written about her that wasn't overly nice, particularly obviously in the years after her execution, in the reign of Mary I as well, when she was trying to re-legitimise her parents' marriage for her own legitimacy. And a lot of people often focus on the fact then that when Elizabeth comes to the throne, she doesn't do what Mary does. She doesn't introduce her own laws or anything to try and um, repeal her own, her, the Act of Succession of 1536 that declares her illegitimate. However, this description here, to me, speaks of why she didn't do that, because I think in her own way, and this, even though this book was made for her, it emphasises on why Elizabeth herself believes in her own legitimacy and her own right to the throne. Obviously, there's another reason as well, which I'll mention a bit later, but... This description of Anne here is 
is incredibly flattering. So it's quite nice to actually read something that is quite flattering to Anne. And it describes her as the most gracious princess, Lady Anne, Marquis of Pembroke, the first wife to King Henry VIII, was crowned Queen of England and France in A.D. 1533. Now, there aren't many descriptions of Anne as the first wife. And obviously, no, we, gosh. That, um, you know, we naturally do feel very sorry, therefore, for Catherine of Aragon as well. Um, but that, to me, really struck out. And then furthermore, the way Elizabeth is described as well as the right virtuous and most noble and godly princess Elizabeth, the sole daughter and heir to the high and mighty Prince King Henry VIII, was crowned Queen of England, France and Ireland in the year of our Lord God, 1558. And that, to me, was like, wow. Yes, take that, Mary, heck. I know, indeed, (laughs) indeed. That was Elizabeth's own little way there of, you know, saying, nope. I believe in my own legitimacy because I think she did. And I think also, as you know, in her coronation procession, she had, because uh, it's often there's so many things with Elizabeth. And I said, this is something that I'm quite interested in is how Elizabeth sort of remembered her mother. Because obviously in history we hear, oh, Elizabeth never thought of her mother and all that. But I think there's certain things that we can see that she did. And another one obviously is her coronation procession. Um, One of the first pageants is the pageant of the roses. At the first one in Grace Church Street, there's this three stages set up that showed her descent from Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, and then Henry VIII and her mother Anne Boleyn, and then her herself at the top. And that's something she herself would have approved. So it's clearly that she, it's very clear that she herself believed in her own lili- her own legitimacy here. And this was her way of so this was her secret way, I feel, of her saying that. And I think this genealogy book is just absolutely incredible. But as I said, there are a couple of images on the British Library website. They don't quite do it justice, but and neither is my description of it as such. But the book itself was just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Yeah, no, I think you've definitely done it justice, James. I can hear the the excitement and the passion <laughs> in your voice as you speak. And and it is difficult to describe these experiences, isn't it? Because it is it is oh, an yeah. emotional connection that happens at the Absolutely. time, and it and it's difficult to put into words. But you you've done a fantastic job. I need to see that oh. item now as well. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just incredible. And obviously, unfortunately, because you can't take pictures of it either no, as well, which, no. is, which is a shame. But yeah, it's it just is. an absolutely um, incredible thing. But it was thanks to obviously Sandy, who had already had um, the clearance from the British Library. So when I got my pass and I was able to go in, she was the one that handed out. Obviously, these things, they don't hand out to just anyone. No, of um, course. Yeah. And, there's a whole protocol behind it and everything when when they do so yeah it's just absolutely um it's just just incredible experience and one of yeah one of the best days ever I just came away there my head was just spinning afterwards and thinking about it now just sends it back into a spin as well (laughs) wonderful well perhaps that's one of those items that they may digitize in the future and we may get to kind of digitally leaf through it that would be wonderful now connected to Queen Elizabeth and her mother one of my favorite items James is Queen Elizabeth its locket ring, which actually contains two miniature enamel portraits. One is of Elizabeth in around 1575 is is what is thought. And one is of an unnamed woman wearing a French hood and a costume of definitely Henry VIII's reign. Now, there is debate surrounding the identity of this particular woman. I, my personal opinion is that it's of the Queen's mother, Anne Boleyn. What do you think, James? I completely agree with that. I think it definitely is um, Elizabeth's mother. The fact that it's so secret and she, yeah. there's no real record of it, and the only real discovery comes of it after her death, just speaks volumes to me. And I think also the portrait actually does resemble Anne quite a bit, particularly a portrait of Anne that is now, obviously, as pretty much all portraits are sadly of Anne lost, but there's a portrait, the Hoskins miniature. Yes. As yep. it, um, that's based, said to be based off a lost or original. And that miniature, it depicts Anne as having a slightly more reddish hair than the other portraits or the famous descriptions of her as, you know, raven black hair. As you are aware, Natalie, there's that sort of description is possibly inaccurate, actually, of Anne. But, you know, the famous depicting her as the dark haired, 
temptress, as it were, is pretty much most likely quite inaccurate. But the yes. actual fact is it probably wasn't. That. And I think when you look at that miniature, plus the locket miniature there, but there's such a resemblance there that I think, oh, actually, yeah, but people do often comment on the hair colour in the in that uh, locket ring. And I think, well, actually, you know, when you compare the Hoskins miniature to that, I, I very much am of the belief that that is Anne. Absolutely. And I think just to, to clarify for anyone listening, these are tiny, tiny little portraits. So if you can imagine a ring that has yeah. a hinged locket. So it was very private, very hidden, said to have only been discovered after Elizabeth's death. So the, the other argument, I suppose, is that it's a portrait of a younger Elizabeth. But you have to ask the question, why would Elizabeth even being uh, Elizabeth, yeah. have a portrait of yeah. herself and of her younger self and keep it quite hidden. And Absolutely. just on the hair colour, that's really interesting, James, because I'm just sitting here looking at her at Anne's um, National Portrait Gallery portrait, the one that most people know. And and the yeah. hair the hair is is brunette in this portrait, and it does have yeah. some streaks of auburn. And uh, if for any yeah. of us brunette people out there, we know that you know you go into sunlight so, and your hair is kind of auburn. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. I was thinking of just the Hoskins, but now she mentioned it. Yeah, the natural portrait one does also bear a strong resemblance as well. And I think like when you compare the Heaver Portrait, National Portrait Gallery, and obviously the Locket Ring, and also as well when you look at, you know, the portrait medal of Anne commissioned in about fifteen thirty four, the most happy medal. There's there yeah. you know, you get quite a similar they all kind of match up, I think, really, in a way. And now while we're on the topic of portrait, it's it's sad that only the most happy medal, which was struck in anticipation of what the king and queen were hoping was a son in fifteen thirty four, is the only contemporary likeness, unfortunately, yeah. of the Queen to survive. And it is quite badly damaged in the British Museum. However, the wonderful Lucy Churchill stone carver yeah reconstructed it and you know made an absolutely amazing reconstruction yeah. that you can purchase i have mine here i'm just looking at it oh, um, yeah. oh i absolutely love it and so yeah, done- the, oh. yeah oh she did a lot of research but the portraits we have are all thought to be elizabethan so but yeah. anyway which is your favorite depiction of anne out of all of those james i would definitely have to say the heaver castle portrait is is my favorite actually um and so the heaver I'm rose saying- one is that the one you mean yeah. with the yeah yeah um, in fact, where I'm sitting now in my flat, um, I'm just looking at my wall and I've got about three different versions of it up here. Oh. And all of it feels like the portrait of Anne is watching me at the moment. So um, yes. <laughs> pressure is beyond for this interview. But uh, yeah, <laughs> so that, that is um, definitely. And I did actually, and he that do actually sell the portrait, they sell prints of the portrait um, of Anne, um, which I was able to buy online and was delivered to me last year and it was um, one of the best purchases I've ever made so yeah I do suggest people um, people buy that as well and also as I said before Heaver to quote your book Natalie you walk in the footsteps of Anne Boleyn when you oh, visit her yeah. yeah. and um, just to see also the book of hours as well and the inscriptions that Anne wrote in them uh, is just absolutely incredible the meaning behind them and everything is just yeah it just blows your mind again it is very moving, isn't it? So I do. I, I really like that Heaver Rose portrait as well. It is quite a lovely, uh, quite a yeah. soft and lovely depiction of Anne, which is really nice. I'm still waiting for the, you know, the contemporary one, the one that dates from her lifetime to be found. <laughs> uh, I know, I know. And that's something I know um, Sandra Vasily was doing her research, trying to do some research on that at the British Library. And we were both sort of at one point looking up you know about this portrait of hers that then went to auction in I think 1700s now I'm thinking and yeah then sort of disappears from the records and everything after that so um yeah but all of us together Natalie will all keep researching and one day we'll find I hold on find it we'll find it behind a (laughs) cupboard in some stately home or who knows hidden somewhere (laughs) well exactly that's right or painted over or something like that yeah <laughs> oh wonderful now i want to finish up james with a question from one of our listeners so laura would like to know why you think anne boleyn continues to captivate us oh why does anne boleyn that's a really good question and Just... everyone has their different reason for this but i think for me, there's two weeks, but one really stands out more than the other. Now, one of those, obviously, is her incredible story. 
that she has, which really no soap opera, TV drama, <laughs> theatre writer could ever make up a better story. But it's something that really almost feels like it should belong to something like that. It's just this incredible story of this woman who rose higher than she ever could have dreamed to have risen in that particular time period, you know, and has this incredible story of an education on the continent, comes back to England, her relationship with the king does change the country's history, and of course she has a tragic end, but her daughter goes on to become one of the most famous monarchs in history. So that's one of the reasons why I think it is, but the reason I feel that it really stands out for Anne, and her story continues to captivate us today, is I feel she comes across when you read about her in biographies or the contemporary records, she comes across as a real person. When you when we read about a lot of these figures, they often come across very they are very distant to us. They're living hundreds of years ago. But there's something about Anne that speaks to people today in the 21st century. Now, I don't say for a second for one second that she was ahead of her time. I think actually she was very of her time. But I think from from the records that we have that survive of her, the reports or anything that she would have written in her own hand there's something that comes across as more real to us today she comes across as human she's not altogether perfect which i think for me personally is what i quite like about her you see her insecurities you she shows her insecurity she shows her jealousy she she has a sharp tongue she's not this submissive person but at the same time you also have this incredible incredibly good side to her as well the her interest in the Reformation, her charity work, her love for her daughter and her promoting of the Reformation and everything. And it's stuff like that, that you get the two different sides which make up what seems to be a real actual person that you're reading about. You can identify with her. You can sympathise with what she's going through. You can sympath- You can feel, even when you're reading reports of her, you know, her temper or something coming to the forefront, you can identify that because you think, well, that's a normal, that's something normal that most people do and that most people have that issue. I think, gosh, certainly I do. (laughs) Um, So I think that is something to me, that's something that I find just so incredible about her because a lot of the times when you read about these figures, they come across almost very distant, very alien. And you're like, oh, I can identify with that person. They almost seem too saintly, too unnatural, too unreal. But Anne comes across as real. And that, to me, I think is why she still inspires so many. There's so many people around the world who are just captivated by a story. I mean, like, you know, yourself, you're speaking to me now from Australia. Yes. And yet you are, and you've set up this incredible site to her. You've written books on her. I've spoken to other people in Australia and I've made some obviously wonderful friends in America. And there's people all over the world and people of all ages, from teenagers to older people. And it's just, she, there's something that about that that just, and I, I believe it is that obviously everyone will have their own reason, but brings people together today and the descriptions of her even her enemies people who didn't like her came to admire her you know the imperial ambassador Eustace Chaquins describes her as braver than a lion she's described as having going to her death with an untroubled countenance she jokes um, in her last days that she'll be remembered as Queen Anne Lackhead before her execution and makes comments about her little neck. And there's incredible other stories as well that you just get moved by her, particularly in her final days and her speech at her trial after she's condemned and found guilty, how she stood up. She's just see, she comes across as brave, intelligent, having spirit and courage, it's, which is what how Thomas Cromwell even describes her as well. Yes. So that to me and I'm just having to shut myself up right <laughs> now. but that to me obviously is why she does speak out to people around yep. the world today it's just incredible it is incredible and what a brilliant response so Laura there you go James gave you a fantastic <laughs> answer and it's so true I agree with everything you're saying so it's it's wonderful but then I can't let you go yet James there's one more thing I, I need to ask you and that is for a Berlin takeaway so something for us to go and explore after this episode do you have a Berlin takeaway for us yes now I've been thinking about this for quite a while um what I could say now, obviously, I will say I hope people will go and do sort of look up all these items we've talked about, because that would be incredible for them to go and see, even try and see images of like the Book of Hours at Heva, her inscriptions and everything, which are incredible. But to me, and I hope this does, you don't mind this, Natalie, but there are, I've, I've come up with two 
No, I don't mind at all. <laughs> I hope that's okay, because I was thinking there are two equal here. Obviously, we've mentioned Hever, but another beautiful location connected to Anne is Hampton Court Palace. Of course, and yes. There is so much there that connects to her to the day from the, to this day, from the Great Hall, which still has her falcon in a glass case, to the H&A is that original and stuff question but there's also if you walk around the gardens there not far off from the privy garden near where the great vine is it is what used to be in the tudor times the pond gardens and we know from records that anne loved the fish from the ponds and wolsey actually sent her fish from the ponds to sort of keep in her favour, as it were. He was sending that off to her. Now, unfortunately, the fish ponds don't quite survive today in the way they used to. The gardens have changed an awful lot over time, still very beautiful. But as you're walking around there, you just get an incredible feel of that place. And I would suggest to people to go and do that because it's quite... And just imagine the workmen or the gardeners taking fish out of the ponds to send off to this lady who is very close, obviously, to the king and the whole country is on the verge of change. And you just imagine that period itself, um, which is just, yeah, you could just picture that and try, try and get that image in your head and put yourself back in, say, 15, 28, 29, as it were, when, we'll, when those fish are being sent to Anne and how the country's on that cusp of change and Anne's and her rise. And sort of, yeah, that's what I, I quite like to think about as I'm walking around there and just imagining all the different ponds and everything. But the other one as well is the musical Six. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm quite a big fan. I've been to see this a couple of times and I absolutely love it. Now, it's very tongue in cheek and it's not for everyone, I'll admit. All the wise have quite incredible songs that take them apart from each other and, you know, give them their own sort of character. Anne's song is particularly tongue in cheek and I love it because it's like the say the the words that she sings is sorry not sorry for what I said that's right we hurt anyone which I quite like because I think that's very much Anne in there and I could just imagine her thinking that think, god this really is Anne um, this song would I think she'd quite like this but I also love the song at the end when the wives sort of come together and basically the idea is don't go there for, I say this to people don't go there feeling you're going to hear a sort of history lesson it's very amazingly it's incredibly actually accurate a lot of it what they sing is tongue-in-cheek but they mention stuff like the reformation and everything like that and Catherine Parson mentions you know that she um, studied scripture had a woman paint her portrait and wrote parts and meditations and things but the last song sees all the wives come together and say that they want to be seen as not just part of Henry's story and part of this famous rhyme but as individuals themselves and also it sees them come together as a group and I quite like that because I feel that a lot of time people put particularly women and particularly even the wise people feel they have to choose a faith now I have said my favourite is Anne Boleyn. I do feel most drawn to her story, but that doesn't mean to say that I have any dislike or anything or any less admiration for the other wives, as I know you do as well, Natalie. And that song to me, just I, I just love because I remember listening to that song. It's very fun. It's a fun pop song. It's it's something for you to, it's a good hour and a half, two hours of escapism, listening to the soundtrack or going to see the show. And it, you come away just feeling quite uplifted and you feel that actually, yeah, the wives aren't just connected to Henry and part of this rhyme, as it were. They also are their own figures as well. And I, and it's done in such a fun way. And I think it promotes a really good message. So I would definitely tell people to go and listen to listen to that. Yeah, I, I'm so glad that just before all these kind of restrictions came in, I was able to see the musical at the Opera House here oh, in Sydney. Fantastic. Oh, it was so, so wonderful. And I took my husband with me. And we're not really huge fans of musicals. So I was a little bit kind yeah. of, oh, but I have to say I had they were the best couple of hours I've had in a long time. Oh, <laughs> we we yeah. danced and sung and, and it was absolutely fantastic. So even if you're not a yeah. huge musical fan, it's still a great show. And yeah, yeah the yeah. soundtrack is a lot of fun. Absolutely. Like you said, I'm, I um, I was a bit unsure what to think when I when I first saw the poster of this and yes. heard the doing this. I was thinking, oh, is this going to work? Um, That's right. And yeah. I went to it and I thought, you know what, I'm going to just go there with a very open mind, and I, which is quite hard for me to do because I can be very instantly like, oh, that's not accurate. Oh, that's not right. Yes. Like, oh, I'm going to go there with an open mind and just accept the show for what it is. And I came away thinking, wow, I just, apps, this is incredible. This has done, the people that did this have done an incredible job. And yeah, and I, 
what's also really nice is lately on the their the six the musical Instagram stories they've been putting up facts about each of the wives and they've been very accurate and actually been very so far they've only done Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn but they're going to obviously I'm sure do the others and they've done a very fair portrayal to each of them giving off the facts and showing them as intelligent women themselves so they've it's a brilliant it gives us such a good message and i really hope that people listen to that and come away from that and stop stop the messages stop pitting women against each other and don't exactly. feel you have to tear one down to build another up absolutely what a great message and what then thank you for those two wonderful tudor oh, takeaways that's, that's fantastic that's right. And James, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you again and talking all things Berlin and Berlin treasures. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me and for and for um, curating this whole special of all things Berlin to mark the uh, anniversary of Anne's execution and coronation this year. It's incredible. And thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you for all the work you do. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Music